What is going on everybody, it's the Frost and we're here for night two of PC Mania's review as we are talking about last night's second second helping of PC Mania and where how where compared to night one, what WWE should do after this for the coming years and all the ups, and downs, lefts and right and whatever. This show, just gonna get out of the way. Night one was better. Plain and simple better. Ladder match. The Boneyard match, uh, the Kevin Owens and Seth Rollins from the normal match to their <clears throat> no DQ part of the show. This was just a letdown. I am also very disappointed because coming into WrestleMania, coming into this show, we've had four weeks. The best, and we've all said it, the best storyline, the best build has been Edge and Randy Orton. Just from the realism, the hatred that's been coming off of these guys, we figured as fans that this was going to be an instant classic of a last man standing match. And unfortunately, this match sucked. The night's, last night's episode, the last night's match between Randy Orton and Edge, just it drug on way too long. It went 37 and a half minutes. The match just felt like it was... I don't know what they were thinking. It felt, it just didn't, I know, like, if you have fans there, it helps out. Fans are 50% of a show. This was a, this was a chance to do an empty arena, let's beat the hell out of each other in the performance center type match. The night that all this stuff happened and all this went down where everything just blew up and we started shutting out half the country, Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa went to the performance center beating the holy hell out of each other. That felt more impactful and more vicious and more real than this. This match just, it bummed me out because, again, I'm sitting here and I'm like, this match is something we've been looking forward to from the get-go. Since Edge got hit with two, a concerto from Randy Orton after he made his debut, his return at the Royal Rumble, and then him coming back, hitting that RKO, on a, on Randy Orton and then concertoing um, MVP who is in the middle of the ring. This felt like this should have been a home run and a match that everybody was going to want to see, and unfortunately, that didn't happen. Now, the first match on the night was, of course, Charlotte Flair versus Rhea Ripley. We'll get into that finish because again, Rhea Ripley losing the NXT Women's Championship was not the best call. I don't know who thought that that was a good idea. Nothing that putting a and putting Charlotte Flair on NXT is one thousand percent an AEW effect move. If AEW was getting their ass kicked by NXT and NXT was in the million, the thousand, the the one point some million or two point some million, and and AEW was doing jack shit. First off, this match doesn't happen. Charlotte Flair and the and the Monday Night Raw and SmackDown crew never step foot on NXT. If NXT held their own against AEW on a weekly basis, then this match does not happen and Rhea Ripley doesn't defend her title at PC Mania. Unfortunately, that is not the case. Then, of course, we had also on the show Otis versus Dolph Ziggler with the revelation on Saturday, on Friday, that it was Mandy Rose and Dolph Ziggler who conspired against Otis. With Dolph, yeah, Dolph Ziggler. And Sonya Deville conspired against Manny Rose and um, Otis. And I'm telling you, that match there needed a crowd. That match there needed 60, 80, 60, 70, 80, 85,000 fans going and erupting majorly when Otis finally topples the evil, villainous Dolph Ziggler and gets the girl as well. And that kiss between those two deserved the fan reaction it was going to get. And it's a damn shame that didn't happen. Alistair Black versus Bobby Lashley. Why the hell that match had to happen is beyond me. Uh, let me see what else we had here. The fatal five way between the women of SmackDown. And okay, it was, it was an okay match. Austin Theory and Angel Garza versus the Street Profits was a nothing match as well. And then we talk about the Firefly Funhouse. 
I don't, I don't even know what you even want to call this thing. I'm sitting here. I watched it last night. I watched it this morning again just for the hell of it. And I'm like, am I on LSD? Did somebody spike my drink? It, because I don't know what the hell this was. It wasn't a match. It was a long, drawn-out segment. But it wasn't a match. It was something different. Out of the two cinematic matches that they did, or cinematic things that they did from the Boneyard match to the Firefly Funhouse match, Boneyard match was, but the Boneyard match was by leagues better, by leaps and bounds better than the Firefly Funhouse. And unlike the world title match last night on, on Saturday night, they ended the show with Drew McIntyre versus Brock Lesnar for the WWE Championship, as they should have. Drew McIntyre is your new WWE Champion. Another, another moment on this card that deserved fan reactions when the match happened. When that three count happened, it deserved the fan reaction. It's not going to get because, boom. All this bullshit going down and WrestleMania being compromised. Sucks. I feel bad for Drew. I feel bad for... I feel bad for Ray Ripley, even though she lost. Coming down that aisle to hook music and having the crowd go crazy is a part of WrestleMania that was missed this year. I feel bad for Otis, Mandy Rose, and the fact that they don't have a crowd reaction when he gets the girl after toppling the big bully. And, oh, by the way, Bianca Bella makes her, annex, uh, her, her WrestleMania debut after the match with Angel Garza and Austin Theory versus the Street Profits. So let's get this started. The first match, of course, oh, well, there was the pre-show match, Liv Morgan versus Natalya. Who cares? Um, let's see here. Liv Morgan wins after she counters a sharpshooter. Trade roll-ups. Liv rolls up her for a win. Who cares? First match of the night, Charlotte Flair versus Rhea Ripley for the NXT Women's Championship, as I said before. This match is only happening because NXT gets thrashed every single week. Yes, since this whole pandemic bullshit has been going on, both ratings have been down. And it sucks, because I guarantee you, had Blood and Guts gone off when it was supposed to be and was scheduled to go off on March 25th, that would have been the first time in a while NXT AEW hit a million viewers. Plain and simple. But that's neither here nor there. But the only reason Charlotte Flair was booked to face Rhea Ripley at WrestleMania and now PC Mania is simple. They're taking the title off of Rhea Ripley, who should not have lost this match, because they gotta try and salvage NXT on the USA Network. I'm still waiting for USA Network to go to WWE and like, listen, this isn't working. We're getting no, like, nobody's watching NXT on my on Wednesday nights. I think it's time we terminate that contract. You can do whatever you want with your NXT, but it's not going to be on our on our show any on our channel anymore because it's not the ratings draw that anybody that WWE was hoping it was going to be. WWE thought for sure because that NXT has been around for eight years now, and it's been on the network and been able to be seen for six years. That. Everybody was going to support NXT, and it wasn't going to go watch AEW. Then they go, well, we have to put NXT on the on WWE Network the very next night. So why would I not go and watch AEW and then go watch NXT later? But <sighs> they go to the ring, Charlotte Flair is out first. Tom Phillips and Byron Saxon on commentary. We get the video showing that led to this match. NXT Women's Champion Ray Lippy is out next with formal introductions. Like the nice little blue and white um, attire that Ray Lippy was wearing. People said it was a homage to DBZ. If she was dressed as Vegeta, then that honestly, honestly tells you what she knew that she was losing and she was going to go out on her sword. This was a very good match. I am not going to lie. But please, shut up, Flair, stop doing that shitty fucking moonsault. You have Io Shirai in NXT until she's gone, which is probably going to be very soon, showing you how to do a moonsault, and then you go out there and make the moonsault look like a laughing stock. Flair Lippy gets the boots up towards the end with the moonsault. Flair goes, gets up and charges with a spear for a close two count. Flair goes for the figure four. But Ripley rolls her up for a two. Flair goes at it again, and this time gets the figure four locked in. 
They trade shots while on the mat. Flair bridges in the figure eight. Ripley is fighting to not tap out, but eventually does tap out, and Charlotte Flair is your winner. I'm going to say this, and I don't think I've ever said this before. I hate the figure eight. It looks like shit. It literally looks like garbage. It doesn't even look like it. I, I wouldn't say this because it probably is probably painful, but it doesn't even look like it's that painful. Hell, the figure four looks like it's a lot more painful than the figure eight. And somebody sat there on Twitter last night and was like, there's no way they're going to take the title off of Rhea Ripley. It's the first time the NXT Women's Championship has been defended at WrestleMania, which it should not have never be defended at WrestleMania. That's what a takeover is for. Yes, takeover was canceled. And it's going to be played out over the next few weeks on NXT television. But I don't want to see the NXT Championship on or any of the NXT Championships on WrestleMania. They have their own show for that. Anyway. Like, no way that's going to happen. It's, it's, it's not going to happen because this is the first time NXT's had the defender. And I'm like, did you not see Charlotte Flair beat Asuka with one arm figure, with a one arm figure eight? Uh, this is WWE. Charlotte Flair has only lost once at WrestleMania. That was last year when, Rayo, when Ronda Rousey was pinned. The Charlotte Flair has never been pinned or submitted at WrestleMania. And that continued this year. Then we have Alistair Black versus Bobby Lashley. Who? Who cares about this match? I see Bobby Lashley switch to long wearing long pants instead of wearing shorts now. But why do I care about this match? I, 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 it's sad because Alistair Black last year with Ricochet was on in a, in a span of a week wrestled for the Raw, NXT, and SmackDown tag team titles. And then a week later, a year later, Ricochet wasn't even on WrestleMania, and Alistair Black is facing Bobby Lashley. Oh, how the mighty has fallen. Let's see here. Match didn't mean much. Lashley goes for a spear, meets a black mask, one, two, three. Do you care? No. Do I care? No. This match. Down Monday Night Raw to a T. So Kayla Braxton is backstage with the SmackDown Women's Champion Bailey and her friend Sasha Banks. Bailey says tonight about the title defense is completely unfair. Kayla Braxton, of course, is badgering about this match and how she has to face her best friend. Bailey says you're just like everyone else on Twitter. She ends the interview, walks off. Pissed off as can be because she has to face five one, four women and has the least, least likely amount of chance of winning the champ, keeping her championship. Kayla stops Banks and asks her how bad she wants to be SmackDown Women's Champion. Banks simply says, we'll just have to wait and see and walks off. More 24-7 shenanigans, don't really care. Gronkowski ends up winning the thing, I really don't care. Otis versus Dolph Ziggler. We um, see Michael Cole and Hall, of, and Hall of Famer elect JBL on commentary. Cole shows us a video package that led to this next match. Ziggler is out first with Sony Neville. Otis is out by himself. He rushes the ring and Ziggler go at it to the floor with Neville. This match, ah, oh, it just sucked watching this match because, yes, it, it, not because of it was a bad match, but it's with the fact that if any match on this show needed a crowd or wanted a crowd, it was this match. Otis being screwed out of a date with somebody he has pined for for years. Not another month, not just months, but years. And this guy, this dashly guy, working to ruin his life and make his life a living hell, conspiring with Sony Deville to screw over Otis. Finally, it all was revealed on Friday. And they don't even have, they don't even have a crowd to make this big. To make this what we want it to be. <laughs> Get that crowd reaction when this match, the boo, the boos and the cheers, and the, every time Otis does something, people would go crazy. Every time Zolf Ziggler goes to do something, they would boo him with all this disdain in the world. Unfortunately, that didn't happen, but Deville cheers on Ziggler onto the floor. Otis fights up and out of the hold. Ziggler kicks Otis. Otis catches him and launches him into the second turnbuckle. Otis with more offense, and he dances around and rocks Ziggler with more strikes. 
dances on the on the ropes but turns around to the right hand. Ziggler, Otis level Ziggler with a pair of clotheslines. Oops and slams Dolph Ziggler in the middle of the ring. He stands on Ziggler's back to keep him from crawling out. Otis whips Ziggler hard in the corner and he goes down. And Otis with another big whip into the corner and a third as Otis continues to dominate. They go to the floor and Otis launches Ziggler into the barrier. He sends Ziggler into the ring. Otis brings him back in, hits his version of the compactor, more back and forth. The Vell has seen enough of this. She gets on the apron. She's looking to get it like to distract Otis, and he she does with the referee back turn. Big low blow from Dolph, from Dolph Ziggler taking down Dolph, taking down Otis. Just as it looks like things are going for the worst for Otis, Mandy Rose's music hits. Tony Deville just looked at this look of like, oh shit, my life is fucked. She was looked like she was scared to death. Mandy comes out, does something, claps uh, Deville in the face, but beating on her, wailing on her, throws her in the ring to distract the referee. Comes around, Dolph Ziggler says, what are you doing? You're ruining everything. Big low blow to Dolph Ziggler. Otis with the caterpillar. One, two, three. Otis beats Dolph Ziggler. Mandy Rose comes in. They celebrate. He looks at her when he has her on the arm. Pulls her into a, and he holds her in his arms. He looks at her. They look at each other. He gets a leg look on his face, and they get, and then Rose goes in for the big kiss. Which just, like, disgust JBL completely. He's like, go to commercial, go to break, go to break. It was, it, it just, it's like, it was great to see. It was a much earned um, win and a much earned moment, but it would have been so, so much more. This would have been a moment of WrestleMania that we would look back on over the next 10 plus years. But without the crowd, it doesn't, it just fall like everything that we see outside of the Boneyard match, because the Boneyard match, even if they did have a crowd of 80,000 people and they still did the Boneyard match, it would still have felt the same whether they had people in WrestleMania or not, because it was in a different location. And honestly, if they would have had 80,000 people at Raven James Stadium, the Boneyard match should have still went the exact same way that it did. I guess the same thing with the Firefly Funhouse, but we'll talk about that in a bit. And it's just like if any match, any match needed the crowd to give us that... Mo that that this this like that big WrestleMania moment. WrestleMania every year has one moment that we look back on. This would have been it. No ifs ands or buts about it. This would have been it. Becky Lynch holding up the championships at the end of the night last year. Seth Rollins with the heist of the century of WrestleMania 31. This would have been that WrestleMania moment. We all look back on Otis with Mandy in his arms. Wraps her, arm, her other arm around his head and goes in for that kiss. Boom. Printed. Done. Immortal lasts forever. This year's WrestleMania, outside of the Boneyard match in the Firefly Funhouse, you're really not going to see them look back on because... Why would you? A crowd of zero? Yeah. No. Then we go into the most disappointing match of the night. We see the last man standing match, Edge. Versus Randy Orton. I will say they did have a great moment in the beginning of this because Edge is out there. He's waiting. He's 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 dumb babyface syndrome, but he's Orton music hits. Edge is in the ring. He's sitting there. He's ready to beat the hell out of this son of a bitch for what he said and did to his wife and what he's done to me. When all of a sudden we have an RKO out of nowhere with Randy Orton wearing a bunch of like a black sweater, black pants, and boots. Replay shows Randy Orton was a camp was a guy with a camera. He was being the cameraman at ringside. Referee tells Edge if he can get to his feet, then he'll start the match. Finally gets to his feet. Edge swings with Orton dodges and drops him with another RKO. The referee counts. This match went on for 37 minutes. And I'm trying to sit there and enjoy the match, and I just can't. It's just one of those things that I don't know what is it is about this match alone. I don't know if they, like, uh, because the Boneyard match, apparently, I found out this morning, was that that match took eight hours to film, which they did a hell of a job. 
My question is, how many hours did it take for them to film this match? And how much of this match could they have cut out to make this match feel more impactful? This was a last man standing match. This match should have had brutality. This match should have had vile and hatred towards each other. This should have been a match that we look back on as like, that was a damn good match. We didn't get that. We got a match that felt more pedestrian at that. I don't know what it was about this match, but it just drug on and on and on and on. And it's like, it, it, it sucks because, yeah, usually when you do an Ice Man standing match like this and they go all over the place with a crowd, you hear the crowd in the background. So when and the crowd's watching on, it's on, a monitor, on the big screen or something, you hear the crowd reacting when Orton or Edge is beating the hell out of each other or doing a big move. But you just didn't get that in this. Just didn't get that. Even when they had the finish, which was Randy Orton down. He's barely moving. Edge takes a sw he just Orton's on his head his head is on a chair and Edge is looking down at him. He's got this emotion on his face of like, I didn't want to do I don't want to do this, but you're making me do it, Orton. He takes this there, he takes this, this he takes the chair and swacks him in the head. The referee walks, watches, looks for a second, and the ref keeps counting and he makes a ten count to finish the match. Even that big chanchetto at the end, it just didn't have the impact it probably should have. The emotion on Edge's face just didn't feel like it was there all the time. This was my this was my most anticipating match, and then it turned out to be the most disappointing match of the show. And it sucks. I don't want to harp on these guys. They beat the hell out of each other, but it just didn't the anger wasn't there. The vile the the violence wasn't there like it should have been. The vitriol wasn't there. These guys, it just felt like two kids. It just felt like two kids who hated each other and they didn't know why they hated each other. They fight. They were fighting, but they don't know why. <sighs> After the match, Ed stands tall as the music hits. He drops to his knees in front of Orton, puts his head against him, apparently telling him something. You know, thank you. Probably thanking him for the match, you know what they do. He continues to recover as his music plays. Back from break, we see several people chasing the 24 Sampion Mojo Rally. As I said, Gronkowski ends up winning it after doing a dive off of the perch onto everybody and pinning Mojo. So I don't care. Angel Garza and Austin Theory versus the Street Profits for the Raw Tag Team Championships. And Lena Vega out here wearing some. Like some kind of dress, some kind of attire with some skulls on the shoulder pads. So, good stuff there. <sighs> this match was okay. It was okay. The Street Profits, they win. And I think the, the best part of the match, of course, was the um, final seconds. Terry slams Duncan, but floored. And he looks like he might have the win. But as that's going on, Terry pinning Dawkins. Montez Ford with the big huge frog splash. This dude's got so much height, I don't even know where he gets it from. Flashes and crushes both men. Theory rolls off of Dawkins. Dawkins rolls over onto Theory. One, two, three. The Street Profits retain the titles. But after the match, the Profits stand tall. If, and here's the thing if this match was going to be this short, why have the match? Why would you sit there? And give me a match that didn't last that long. But and here's the thing. You had 18 matches. 18 matches. Or 19 matches, something like that. There was no reason to have this match. Next year's WrestleMania is gonna have to be something better, but we'll talk about that here in a bit. This match only lasted six minutes and twenty seconds. Now, don't get me wrong, most matches on both nights lasted less than 10 minutes. But why would you call Austin Theory up to replace Angel Guard, to replace Andrade, who, mind you, had a rib injury? All you were going to do was have the match be 6 minutes and 20 seconds. Last night, on Saturday night, you had 
the ladder match. You had uh, Kevin Owens versus Seth Rollins, which went very long. You had the Boneyard match. That's three matches right there that were better than anything outside of anything on this sh on this on last night that we could have had. But after the match, Garza and Theory attacked the champions, beating them down. Dawkins is sent out while they double team Ford in the middle of the ring. They fold ho they hold Ford up while the, the beggar delivers a kick to the face. Bigger with another thick kick, she's like, how does that feel? How does that feel? As she starts beating on him. All of a sudden, with no music, which mind you, this, this right here is how you do this. Harking back to Friday, when Otis came out to help his buddy and chase off Dolph Ziggler. Otis's music hits, and it just felt like, it felt scripted and felt weird. Here, Bianca Belair runs out without her music whatsoever to attack Zelina Vega, beats the hell out of her, pits her with the KOD, and then she's there celebrating in the middle of the ring. Montez Ford comes in, crawling in like he's all like doggy eyes, like puppy dog eyes and everything. He's like just grooving to his wife's music as her music hits. Ford and Dawkins return in the ring, they grab their titles and celebrate with her on their shoulders. The champs celebrate, and that is that. So, the match was was okay. It was six minutes. It should have went a little bit longer. But hell, we had that thirty seven minute um, title match, uh, thirty seven minute last man standing match, which could have been cut down to twenty five minutes, and it would have been a lot better. But yep, yeah, here you go. Bianca Belair makes her a her main roster WrestleMania debut. My question is. Does this mean that Bianca Belair is coming up, or is this a one-time thing? Yes, I know it's in the Performance Center. But is Bianca Belair making the jump to the main roster? That is a question that I don't have a clue. Maybe she is, maybe she's not. Maybe it was a one-time thing because it's her husband. Only time will tell. Addison Lee appears on the post and says, Well, Gronkowski's the new 24-7 champion. He's out of here, so somebody has to host this. So that's going to be me. Let's keep this going on, and we get to a fatal flyway between Sasha Banks, Naomi, Lacey Evans, Tamina Snooker, and Bailey. Now, this match. Hmm. Let me think about this match. When it comes to this match, we can definitely say that hopefully they're doing this right. But they are definitely building to Sasha Banks versus Bailey at SummerSlam, hopefully. Now. I predicted, and I think everyone else predicted, that possibly Bailey was going to drop the title in a way where Sasha Banks would win the title, but the way they did it, first I thought it was a bad idea the way they did it, but then I sat back and I think, and I thought over the last four well, few hours that was like, having Sasha Banks get eliminated by Lacey Evans in the match, then having Sasha Banks come back and help Bailey pick up the win, because Bailey, who was the middle of the match, Towards the end of the match, ends up running to try and take a knee, uh, knee, Lacey Evans in the corner. It ends up, Lacey ends up moving, and Sasha Banks ends up eating that knee. Inadvertently, but that's what happened. Sasha Banks ends up eating a woman's right. He's gone. It came down to Lacey Evans and Bailey. Bailey and Lacey Evans battle for a bit, and then all of a sudden, Banks comes back, backstab her, and eventually, Banks, um, Bailey wins. Tamina was out first. Who gives a shit? Tamina Snooker, which the person who was running the Wrestling Inc. What, um, channel, the Wrestling Inc. Um, Twitter account last night was like pulling for Tamina. Tamina Snooker was only in this match because, because Carmella didn't want to work during this whole pandemic crap. That's the only reason. After the match, Bailey bring, Banks brings the title in the ring as Bailey recovers while her music hits. She, Banks raises Bailey's arm in the middle of the ring. Bailey talks trash to the floor to the announcers and poses with the corner as Banks makes her exit and watches from the floor. They started the dissension last night. Hopefully, they build, push it, they do it the right way. And knowing WWE, fans have been wanting this match between Bailey and Sasha Banks for at least four years. Three, four years. WrestleMania, uh, the first Women's Battle Royal two years ago, when Sasha Banks was eliminated by Bailey. Go back and watch that moment. And the crowd erupts because we all thought Bailey eliminated Sasha Banks and won the match. 
And then they had Naomi win it because that was that was the dumbest thing they could have done there. But anyway. Um Bailey Sasha Banks needs to happen. Of course, everyone expected Bailey to be the baby face, but Bailey's on this heel run that she's probably the best version of Bailey we've had in a while. So Bailey's not gonna be a baby face. Sasha Banks is going to be the baby face. If you think about it, when Sasha Banks came back, yes, she attacked she attacked. Natalia, he had feuded with, with Becky Lynch, which I think that should have went a lot longer than it did, but they moved her over to SmackDown. And, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, let me think here. Sasha Banks never really been, like, she's a quote unquote heel, but she's never really had that, like, when Bailey came, when Bailey turned heel completely, and she did her whole cut the hair, killed the things. Kill the um, Bailey buddy. She grabbed the microphone after the, her match and said, Listen up, bitches. Screw all of you. That's a heel. Sasha Banks really hasn't done that. She's been the fuck, she's been the fo the lead the follower while Bailey's been the leader. And Bailey is going to something's gonna happen and Bailey's gonna end up double crossing Sasha Banks. Hopefully not yet. Not yet. And that match leads to SummerSlam. Only time will tell. I'm hoping WWE doesn't screw this up, but this is WWE. The same company that has Shayna Baszler kill five women in the Elimination Chamber, eliminate eight women at the Royal Rumble, and then get rolled up and beat by Becky Lynch last night on, on Saturday night. So I don't trust them to book this. This is also the company that had Bailey turn quasi heel for a minute two, three years ago when she brutalized Sasha Banks and then sent them the counseling. So, do I trust WWE? Not in the slightest. Let's talk about the Firefly Funhouse quote-unquote match. I don't know what the living fuck this was. This was not a match. This was a full long segment of about 20 minutes. This match, quote unquote, was definitely if you are somebody who watches wrestling like before you get like when you get high, this was the match for you. Holy hell, Jay Bray Wyatt is a genius. Holy hell, Bray Wyatt is one of the smartest guys out there. Was if you don't like goofy and you don't like goofiness in your wrestling, you don't like theatrical stuff like this in your wrestling, then this isn't a match for you. But this wasn't a segment for you. This wasn't a match. This was a segment. Just because The Fiend put, came out at the end and put John Cena and the Man of Claw and his sister Abigail doesn't make it a match. Mm -hmm. John Cena comes out in the performance center. And it gets interrupted by the Firefly Funhouse reel. Wyatt appears at the Firefly Funhouse. He talks about how another realm exists filled with monsters and others. He addresses Cena and says he's about to face his most dangerous opponent yet. Himself! He welcomes us to the Firefly Funhouse. And then he opens that door behind him and walks out of it. Cena is now in the Firefly Funhouse. And he spots Abby the Witch and just gets spooked a little bit. Family Rabbit pops up by the TV and says Wyatt went... Like, hey, John, dude, hey, what's up? What's up, dude? Oh, yeah, I saw Wyatt. You looking for him? You, you went that way. You went through that door. So Cena, be careful. Cena opens the door, enters, and he's somewhere in the dark. And then the evil boss puppet, Vince McMahon, appears looking like Vince McMahon. He tells Cena to prove that he is this and that. Uh, do, you, do you have ruthless, like, the ruthless aggression and yada, yada, yada? John Cena's like, what the hell is going on here? We see Wyatt in a, in a ring now. You see flashes from Cena's debut with Hall of Famer Kurt Angle years ago. Wyatt repeats the exact promo that Kurt Angle said instead of saying Angle, he says Bray Wyatt. And Cena comes out wearing his gear from his debut against Kurt Angle doing his with, a, with the large SmackDown fist. So they must have been in the WWE warehouse. I don't think WWE is going to sit there and take that SmackDown fist anywhere else. Just put it in the warehouse and go from there. 
Athena answers the ring. Wyatt asks him what makes he think he can hang with Bray Wyatt. He says ruthless aggression. He swings. Bray, that Wyatt misses, like ducks, and he's like, who thought this was going to be a good idea? Brett John Cena's like, ruthless aggression. Swing. He misses again. Ruthless aggression. Swing. Ruthless aggression. Swing. And Bray Wyatt keeps ducking every time, and he's like, no wonder you got, almost got fired. This is your biggest failure. Which John Cena on the ruthless aggression, um, video thing when they they had the enter John Cena one, he said that Ruthless Aggression was his was a failure. It was failure to him because he almost got fired. If it wasn't for the Doctor Thugonomics, he would have been fired. No problem. He keeps swinging and keeps missing. Wyatt taunts him some more, chasing Wyatt Cena chasing him out of the ring. Evil evil boss and mercy the buzzer on commentary. As we see a Saturday Night Main Event intro, we see the fitness gym bro, bro version of Wyatt cutting an old school WWF promo, introducing his tag team partner who is now Johnny Large Meat. Cena raises with the dumbbells as he as as they as li like the paper. He just over over and like just keeps going with them like back and forth as fast as he can, just spamming like if you're playing a video game and you're like supposed to hit a button to be like you know. Moot like to work out faster. Well, he's on. He's on that button to spam. He's spamming that button. He's like just going completely raging and in a paper. He's just going completely crazy. And then he just like breaks down and he can't lift his arms. He's going back and forth trying to, you know, do something. And then, <laughs> boy, it's like what you're gonna do when you realize that ego, the ego, something runs wild on you. And he grabs Cena and throws him into this into the abyss. And Cena is back into the the SmackDown fist. This time he is the doctor of thugonomics. White is in the ring. Cena hits the ring and only can only speak in rhymes. And he bring he warns Wyatt to run. Wyatt gets emotional, talks about how he had to earn everything. And they still take it away from him. But Cena's chances are unlimited. Cena is not a hero, he is a bully, a horrible person who takes the weakness of others and turns them into jokes. He says Cena will do anything for fame. Congratulations, Cena, you're the man now. Poor, lonely Cena. Wyatt says this is Cena's last chance now, the floor is his. Cena mounts more and changes, throws it in the corner, but Wyatt moves. Cena turns back around. Wyatt has the John Cena, Dr. Thugonomics chain. He wraps it around him, his hand, and he whacks John Cena in the head, knocking him out. Then we see the Eater of Worlds, Bray Wyatt, somewhere like the Florida Swamp. We see flashes of a WrestleMania match six years ago. He tells Cena to run. They jump back into the ring. The old version of Wyatt attacks Cena. Goes for the sister Abigail. Cena slides out, and Wyatt says, "We we both know that isn't enough. Isn't enough to end it, Superman. But this is." He hands the Cena. He has a chair in his hands. He hands it to Cena. Wyatt says, gets on his knees and says. Six years ago, you had a chance to change, change, um, change the world to, um, to, you made the wrong choice. Now, so now fix it. You know, swings the chair and Wyatt is gone. Then we see a bunch of WCW Monday Nitro graphics. Last now, Wyatt is in the ring wearing a wolf pack t-shirt. He channels Eric Bischoff. Who is shown several times in the flashes and Wyatt as Bischoff introduces John Cena, who's supposed to be the Hulkster. Cena comes out with the Hollywood Hogan music, wearing the black and white NWO shirt. He ends up, and he's like being all like NWO-ish. They do the two sweet together. John Cena turns around, he takes the hat off, he turns back around and just tackles Bray Wyatt, who he thinks is Bray Wyatt. We see flashes of Cena's career as he keeps swinging away, thinking he's beating the hell out of, out of Bray Wyatt when it turns out to be Huskis the Pig Boy. Fiend. Finally appears behind John Cena, who is no longer wearing what he was wearing before. He's just back in his gear, minus the shirt. Fiend, Cena turns around as he gets up. The Fiend ends up dropping him with the sister Abigail, tying the mandible claw. We hear laughter as, they, as we show Bray Wyatt pin, counting the pin. One, two, three. Fiend stands tall, holds his arms out, and that is that. He cut back to Titus O'Neil, he just has this shocked look on his face. He's like, I have no idea what I just saw. Neither do I. I have no idea what the hell this was. This was the strangest 
thing I have ever seen. I enjoyed the Boneyard match though. Compared to this, this was not a match. This was absolute ridiculousness. At its finest. Is that a bad thing? This was just... Ugh, I can't even right now. I can't even. But it would. Do you think John Cena vs. Bray Wyatt would have been better as a match itself? I don't know. All I can say is this was something different. Absolutely different. So we come down to the main event. Drew McIntyre vs. Brock Lesnar. WWE Championship match. If you thought this match was going to go 20 minutes where they beat the living piss out of each other, you, have a, you are looking at the wrong Brock Lesnar. Claymore kick. Claymore, um, F5, 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 Claymore kick, Claymore kick, Claymore kick, Claymore kick, one, two, three, Joe, Drew McIntyre is your WWE champion. Drew stands tall, he raises the title, he replays, he hits his knees at the title. After looking down at Lesnar, who is still on his dream, he hits the corner and poses the title, celebrates, night two of WrestleMania goes off the air. WrestleMania PC Mania num night number two was 1,000%, 1,000%. A let it was definitely a nose downward dive compared to my night one. Night one was superior by far. But here's my thing I believe I said it yesterday and I'll say it again. WrestleMania from here on out needs to be two nights. If you're going to have 18 plus, if you're going to have this many matches, I would rather have, I would rather have two nights. A WrestleMania and one. WrestleMania 37 should be two nights. WrestleMania 38, two nights. What do you do about the Hall of Fame? Hall of Fame should be on Thursday. SmackDown on Friday. If SmackDown ends up moving from Friday to somewhere else, you put the Hall of Fame on Friday then. But I don't want to see WrestleMania go back to a one-night format. If you're going to do this many nights for this many matches, it would night 16, 18, 16 matches, I believe. Yes, like, no, it was, I'm sorry, 18 matches and 9 matches on each night. Then I don't want to see WrestleMania go back to a one-day event. This was so much easier to stomach over two nights. The problem is, with doing two nights is, this year was different because, of course, no crowd, no nothing. But the fact that you have, the problem that's going to come into it is if they want to try and do two nights, Getting people to come back for that second night. Which is why you usually have some better matches on night two. We had Edge versus Randy Orton. Rhea Ripley versus Charlotte Flair. You had Drew McIntyre versus Brock Lesnar. Which was way better than Goldberg versus Braun Strowman. For sure. You had all these big matches. All these matches that last night. That should have just beat the brakes off of night one. And unfortunately it didn't happen. The heavy hitter and the match that should have been for all of us to be like, yeah, this is my match. This is the match I want to see. Was, of course, Edge versus Randy Orton. That ended up becoming a big dud. 37 minutes, and it's like, I want violence. If you're going to do a last man standing match, I want violence to the max. I want these two to go out there and beat the brakes off of each other. And it just felt like, I think the pandemic state of shit had an effect on this because they didn't want to do too much to where they could end up like like cutting each other like cutting each other open and possibly causing themselves to be infected and whatever whatever this was just nxt takeovers do not be the only the only big four pay-per-view that needs an nxt takeover is survivor series SummerSlam doesn't need it royal rumble doesn't need it and wrestlemania sure as hell doesn't need it you put those takeovers on, on the, at their own time, then you would have an NXT could live on its own. It would give you more things to do for WrestleMania. WrestleMania 37 should be a two-night event. 38, a two-night event. 39, two-night. 40, two-night. Do I want to see... And here comes the problem with that. If they go to two nights, what happens if we go from 16 matches to 40 matches? Or... 30 match, uh, 25 matches because Vince McMahon wants to keep adding and adding and instead of doing 
two nights of three hours, we do two nights of six hours. That's the one thing that would probably bug the hell out of me is that Vince McMahon goes, you know what? Or whoever's in charge at the time goes, you know what? We're going to do two nights, but we're going to do two nights at six hours. That would be too much, and I would fail miserably. There were some bright spots in this entire thing. Was WrestleMania 37 one of the, uh, 36 one of the best WrestleManias ever? Hell no, it wasn't going to be. It was definitely the strangest, but it, WrestleMania, hopefully, when all this is said and done and this is over with and we can finally get back to seeing good like wrestling with people in the stands, um, we can actually have ourselves a great, have ourselves some good wrestling. This did what it was supposed to do, give you something to watch, you try and take your mind off of it. I mean, yes, having the crowd, no crowd there, and seeing the place empty does is a constant reminder of the times we're in. But the Boneyard match was definitely a major highlight of this thing. Um, Seth Rollins versus Seth Rollins versus Kevin Owens in that, D, that no DQ portion of their match was leagues better and more impactful of, on how to do anything like the Last Man Standing match should have been. That's just my opinion. But that is WrestleMania, PC Mania, Night 2. PC Mania overall was an average show. There were some good spots, but a lot less, a lot more, um, a lot, there was a lot more lowlights than highlights in this show. And that was going to happen because of there being no crowd. A lot of match, just like, okay, Brock Lesnar versus Drew McIntyre. Brock Lesnar hits three F5s. And every time Drew McIntyre kicks out, normally with a crowd, you would have some kind of reaction. But with no crowd there, the, it doesn't get the same effect as it would have been without, with the crowd there. The ladder match. Having those guys go out there, hitting all of those big spots. The Spanish fly. That's, the, that's one of the biggest spots in that match. The Spanish fly. The tight rope into the Spanish fly. You know how kind of, what kind of reaction that match would have got if there was a crowd there? I do commend WWE and everybody who was in any, any, anybody who was in a match on these two nights. I commend you for going out there and doing what you could do to help us get at least six hours and, and six hours and twenty minutes of our weekend away from bullshit and fear mongering that they do. WWE did advertise yesterday or Saturday. WrestleMania 37, but yesterday they advertised Money in the Bank for May 10th. I hope by the time this is over, this is over by then, and we can have some kind of crowd at Money in the Bank 2020. Because two Money in the Bank ladder matches at, Wrestle at Money in the Bank with no crowd is going to be something hard to sit through. But that is your WrestleMania um, Night 2. If you hit that subscribe button, comment down below, like or dislike this video, find me on Twitter at the Bronze Club, find me on twitch.tv slash Bronze Club, and I will see you guys later for Monday Night Raw, the night after PC Mania one and two, Night 1 and 2. Till then, you guys have a good one, and I'll see you later.